worry. You've already said things that could get you in trouble. So I think um, and, uh, and Hannah, Hannah has agreed and Ying has agreed and uh, Ying is going to kindly uh, upload it to YouTube later. Wonderful. OK. <laughs> I, wa I wash my hands of any problems afterwards, OK? <laughs> all right, all right. No, no lawsuits, all right. <laughs> So you're in your you're in your homes, um, Ying and Bill. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Hannah? Yeah, I'm in my Boston you? home here through. Uh, oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, one room, one room. So it's that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lar Lar I, large room though. A it large is large. Room. It is. I have a little bird, and I've put him as far mm. away as possible with a sheet over him to give him the illusion that it's nighttime. So hopefully. <laughs> as best as I can oh, do. A somebody's... bird chirping, uh, a bird chirping would be fine. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm doing my best with that one. I couldn't have the dog walk or walk the bird. Um... Yeah, yeah, walk the bird. <laughs> That's a good talk. There's an article. There's an article, Hannah. Walk That's the right. bird. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so. Everything else is, is going well. I mean, you're both teaching. Are you teaching online too, Ying? Or just doing um, research? No, currently I, oh, yeah. I taught online like, um, like two months ago. Yes. Okay. So I'm about to teach in the summertime in the UBC uh, teacher candidates cohort. So I'm looking forward to it. That's great. I used to do that too. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. Um, a while ago, not that long ago, but earlier oh, not that long ago yeah. <laughs> not that long ago not no long ago. yeah i was i was thinking oh you started at ubc in 2005 bill correct or that's when you left lsu right and i started at ubc right. 2009 right. so you were already right. a few years yeah. in yeah. yeah i was in yeah i was deep in yeah <laughs> Already and, uh, underwater, yeah. And Bly is still the faculty dean. Oh, uh, well, he is until June 30th, and uh, we say farewell then. Oh, OK. And uh, Jan Hare, if you, if you remember Jan Hare, she's the associate dean for Indigenous Affairs. She's the new interim dean. Great, I'll look, I'll look her up. I don't know if I recall her, but I'll, I'll look yeah. it up. Yeah, well, she's a very smart woman. That's great. I was at a, yeah. the, the day before this conference started, Joe Dillabo, obviously from former UBC faculty at Cambridge now invited me to a Zoom session like this right. with Andrea Cavarero, yeah. the Italian uh, philosopher who uh -huh. we did a workshop. And so it's been a lot of wonderful Zoom days the last few days, yeah. given that I've been alone, you know, working, uh -huh. on, not totally alone, but on sabbatical working. Yeah. So it's yeah, very nice. Neat. Yeah, it was neat. Very nice. Yeah, very neat. What what time did you have to log on? It wasn't Six bad for me. No, it was noon for me. No. It was like 5 p.m. for them. It was actually oh, ideal. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, it was, on Monday, it was I, uh, I chaired, a, I, on Monday morning, I chaired a UNESCO session, uh, which was, uh, of course, timed for Geneva. And oh, so okay. it was 6 a.m. for me. That was a little early. Yeah. Uh, but one of the panelists uh, was in Melbourne, and it was 11 p.m. for her, so worse, I think. When Speaking of UNESCO, when's this, do you know when the special issue was actually, I mean, mine has already been published the, online, but the issue itself right. is exciting. Yeah, the issue itself is in press right now. In fact, I just got an email from uh, Simona Popa saying, uh, Bill, uh, here's your uh, editor's introduction. Can you proofread it in 24 hours <laughs> and get it back to me? So uh, it's, it's in press, yes. Okay, good, I'm excited. How many articles? Yeah. How many articles? Oh God, well, we, had over 100, we had over 120 submissions. There are 38 accepted. I'm not sure how many are gonna get in that double issue. I hope she made that decision, not I. Yeah. Oh, interesting. 
Oh, yeah. so some of the articles might just be- It was a articles. lot of work online. They might be online, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an enormous undertaking. I had no idea that uh, we'd have so many submissions. That's why, that's why it took um, six or seven, six or seven oh. months for the review process for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so we're and now at we 201. Oh. Yeah. All right, well, let's start. So yeah. if you'd like to, Hannah, okay. we have a good 34. Okay, great, wonderful. So it is my privilege and deep honor to introduce our speakers today for the special session entitled Teaching in the Techno Nation State. Dr. Ying Ma is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. She is the moderator for UBC's Curriculum Studies in Canada lecture series, and her research seeks to contribute to reconceptualizing teaching in ethical educational dimensions. Professor William Pinar came to the University of British Columbia as the Canada Research Chair in Curriculum Studies and is currently named the Tetsuo Aoki Professor in Curriculum Studies. I would also add that prior to these appointments, Professor Pinar served as the St. Bernard Parish Alumni Endowed Professor at Louisiana State University until 2005. It was during this era of his professional life that Professor Pinar chaired a meeting at Antioch University in Seattle during the AERA 2001 conference. He invited a dozen or so people to this meeting to discuss considering the founding of a new organization that would become the American Association for the Advancement of Curriculum Studies. Professor Pinar founded AAACS, and this year we are celebrating its 20th anniversary. If there is time for a discussion near the end of the session, Todd Price and I will help co-facilitate that. With these words in mind, I now turn it over to our honored speakers. Oh, all right, thank you so much, Anna. Um, while educators and middle-class parents debated the merits of online learning. Gettleman and Raj report that in many poor countries, hundreds of millions of children lacked computers or access to the internet. And these children lost access to schooling altogether. Gettleman and Raj also reported that unemployed, economically desperate parents pressed their children into labor, mining sand in Kenya laboring on cocoa plantations in West Africa, painted silver and posing as living statues, begging for money in Indonesia. This worldwide surge erased recent gains in school enrollment, literacy, social mobility, and children's health. All of the gains that have been made, all the work we've been doing will be rolled back, especially in places like India, lamented Cornelia Williams a UNICEF official. Child labor is just one piece of the looming global disaster, Gettleman and Raj continue, as severe hunger is stalking children from Afghanistan to South Sudan. United Nations officials reported a rise in forced marriages for girls and child trafficking generally, especially across Africa and Asia. Teen pregnancies in Uganda increased during pandemic-related school closures. In Kenya, many families force their teenage girls into sex work to feed the family. All the while, the pandemic and the inequitable distribution of vaccines threaten, maybe most of all, those 70 million refugees, the least likely to have soap and water, food and medicine. As these reports confirm, being offline condemns one not only to non-connectivity, but to educational non-existence, as child labor and sex trafficking replace schooling. Online and connected, the privileged still suffer subjection, involuntary citizenship in a transnational state structured by software, animated by images and sounds protocols posing as academic instruction. The device, is the apparatus by which the techno nation state installs its hegemony. 
a techno-political system once parading as direct democracy. While humanity continues to create and posit things, human beings are also posited by things because that is what we essentially are by nature. That's Karl Marx. Our humanity, <clears throat> including our capacity to create things, is also interwoven with our inhumanity. As the above news reports demonstrates, the most vulnerable of human beings, children, can be victimized by adults' desperation, their caretakers' inhumanity. In the new millennium, the nation state mutates, not only a marriage of the two nation and state, but also their fusion in software. Online learning creates supranational national citizens installing supranational supra literacies and loyalties submerged in software, spellbound by the Medusa-like stare of the screen. These could be called the techno-dynamics uh, of nation building, interpolating a supranational identity accented by avatars, passports now usernames and passcodes, soulless citizens of nowhere, as humanity flees the plundered earth for the cloud. The eschatological confidence of Christians is secularized as techno-utopianism. The nation state's emphasis upon its exceptionality, sometimes associated with its uh, often imagined ethnic purity and distinctiveness, with the mythologization of its history and future, goes global, one nation, worldwide, united by software. I wonder if the eruption of old style nationalism in America, Brazil, China, Hungary, Poland, Russia, Turkey, and elsewhere constitute blowback. Many nations sense of uniqueness had already been corroded by post 1960s demands for development, then often associated with the United States, but now also with China, the World Bank and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Now development denotes technologization Infrastructure designed to connect markets, globalizing not only trade and capital, but cyber culture as well. The very concept of globalization obscures the nationalism, imperialism, and colonialism embedded within it. Despite blowback, <clears throat> globalization continues, especially as technologization, especially as technologization, evident in the datification of education. This section is a techno totalitarian state of mind. Schools are being converted into data production centers, Williamson begins, as students are subjected to data mining and data analytic technologies that trace their every digital move. So, all so called data brokers, he continues, collect, curate, and aggregate this information, then sell it back to education stakeholders. We'll let the phone ring. I forgot to, uh, I forgot to remove it. <clears throat> Children have already been reduced to learners. Human capital, quoting Williamson, <clears throat> inner-focused individuals whose own self-responsibility, competence, and well-being, their deep inner soul, interior life, and habits of mind have been fused to the political objective of economic innovation. Innovation has become an Orwellian word for exploitation. What roles do teacher citizens play in this datafication of social life? <clears throat> uh, educators become reduced to data entry clerks, technicians who surveil student learning, who are themselves subjects of digital governance, compelled to provide detailed and intimate data concerning performances that are then made available for public display, display and scrutiny. Soon enough, teachers may be replaced as pedagogy becomes a function of automated machines, so-called teacher bots and cognitive tutors. What Williamson terms computerized software agents designed to interact with learners, conduct constant real-time analysis of their learning and adapt with them. 
These developments document the datafication of education. It's recodification as quantifiable information stored in databases for measurement and calculation. Even one's private self becomes quantified with sensor-enabled devices tracking one's movements, sleep patterns, feelings, and sexual activity. Quoting in Williamson, emptying the self of any and all meaning. As quoting Hahn, the self gets broken down into data until no sense remains. The reason both traditional surveillance and datafied tracking conflict with notions of freedom, Coldry and Maias explain, derives from something common to both, their invasion of the basic space of the self on behalf of an external power. That external power is software. Composed in code, software is a set of instructions structured and operationalized through algorithms, what Williamson summarizes as the conversion of inputs into outputs. Code, codes make software work. Code programs reality. Co-opting, co quoting Williamson again, agency, who does what? Materiality, what we can touch, see, and hear, and sociality, how we form attachments and collective belonging. Williamson sees software as a substrate, but there's nothing underlying about it, as by his own admission. Code structures are, quoting him, personal perceptions, sensations, and transactions. It crystallizes new social formations, publics, and groups. Never innocent, he concedes. Code, quoting him, derives from the worldviews of its originators and that are projected onto its recipients. Projected and installed, he might have added, as they become internalized psychically, quoting on, quoting Koopman, excuse me, we are soothed by data that calm us into stillness and eventually into unthinking sleep. And enacted behaviorally, a scale of structuration Williamson acknowledges. Code, quoting him, code augments and ultimately produces collective, political, and economic life. Software engineers and programmers not only operate technical systems he allows, but also social outcomes. In effect, they codify what used to be called society. Algorithms, Williamson continues, ensure social ordering, governance, and control, what he characterizes as an algorithmic ideology. That ideology means that, quoting, coders select our values for us and potentially prioritize the interests of private technology companies over public interests and concerns. There's no potentially about it as private technology companies usurp public interests and in so doing constitute themselves as de facto officials of the techno nation state, structuring, governing, and directing citizenry, a concept now virtual, no longer exclusively geographical or ethnic or mythological. Ideological control can seem almost complete as education conceived as one of the humanities, even as a social science is replaced by the so-called educational data sciences derived from the psychological and cognitive learning sciences. One of these, psychoinformatics, deploys data mining and machine learning to detect, characterize, and classify behavioral patterns. Education data science, Williamson explains, translates into the unprecedented tracking of student behaviors and actions through big data and their analysis through algorith algorithmic techniques of data mining and machine learning. Once associated with emancipation, education becomes exclusively technical, sealed within software, the architecture of which constitutes one worldwide panopticon, the techno nation state. Learning analytics software is designed to track individual students in real time, to predict future progress, surveillance, and service to the optimization of learning. The assumption is that students' access to knowledge can become a function of automated algorithmic processes and techniques. Understanding seems incidental. Assessment is all, as what is sought are technologies that will make emotional measurement and management possible. One is reminded of Goffman's con concept of the total institution, the possibility of turning or being turned from a live person into a dead thing, into a stone, into a robot, an automaton, without personal autonomy or action, and it without subjectivity. The total institution Goffman was referencing was the prison, 
now also a metaphor for the techno nation state. Measurement and management will be encoded in new devices and platforms that measure and intervene in the body, behavior, and mood of the learner, Williamson warns. Such a totalizing scale of measurement and intervention will not be limited to learners. As Williamson appreciates, quoting in data driven pervasive persuasive technologies confer upon citizens particular ways of thinking and behaving. In other words, for educating citizens to participate in the dominant governing styles of society. That society is virtual, not actual. It's styles, software design, homogeneous, standardized, what the Canadian political philosopher George Grant suspected would be a universal tyranny destined to eradicate the historic aspirations of the Western world and particularly its North American experiments. Citizenship in such society is ensured by seduction. Such seduction starts early, embedded in an affective computing, biosensor and biometric technologies for measuring children's moods that have been developed for schools, including devices designed to detect excitement, stress, fear, engagement, boredom, and relaxation directly through the skin. Such internally installed surveillance should ensure compliance, rationalized by growth mindsets research associated Williamson reports with behavioral economics and its subset nudge theory. In its integration of research from psychology, neuroscience, and economics, such research promises to address shortcomings in individuals' decision-making processes. Williamson cites Class Dojo, an app that enables teachers to collect, store, and visualize data about the children in their classroom. According to its website, Class Dojo is installed in 95% of US schools. What Williamson subsumes in a totalizing, quoting him, governmentalization of behavior change. That government is the world's new, if officially unrecognized, universal state, a total institution, the techno nation state. So, you see that the datafication of education extends well beyond students' learning. Implementing what Williamson worries is a biopolitical strategy to produce pathology-proofed citizens capable of coping with the stresses and anxieties themselves caused by government policies and capitalist culture combined. Not only pathology-proof, but also emotionally maximized, as personal well-being is understood to be the prerequisite for the development of productive human capital under the conditions of digital capitalism. Not only nurture, but nature is targeted. Educational genomics uh, draws on data about the human genome to identify particular traits that are understood to correspond with learning so that corporate employees can develop curriculum according to each child's DNA profile. Neurocomputation connects neuroscientific expertise with technical development, commercial ambitions, and governmental objectives, Williamson continues, providing infrastructure for neuroeducation based on the brain-based nature of learning, disclosed through advanced brain scanning and imaging techniques. Among the applications include computer-based brain training programs, Multimobile forms of virtual reality designed to stimulate regions of the brain associated with learning and the design of human like artificial tutoring agents. No more teachers' pension payments, no more school buildings, each requiring upkeep. The screen at which the child stares provides everything, total control for the sake of learning. Williamson reports that Pearson is proposing to bypass the cumbersome bureaucracy of mass standardized testing and assessment and instead focus on the AI-enhanced classroom, providing detailed and intimate analytics of individual performance, which will be gained from detailed modeling of learners through their data. In Pearson's plan, educational systems will be recast as neurocomputational networks where brain-based technologies will perform a constant measurement and management of learning environments and of all the individuals who inhabit them. Like Pearson, IBM operates on the assumption that human qualities can be augmented, strengthened, and optimized via intelligent machines in order to deal with technical and economic demands. In 2016, IBM and Pearson partnered their cognitive computing and artificial intelligence project 
operationalizing the view that the brain is mental software that requires being updated all the time in order to stay aligned with an increasingly networked social technical environment that is itself retooling the brain, retooling psychosocial life too, as sociality shifts from its civic associations with historic nation states. The citizenship in a transnational techno state that universal homogeneous society George Grant and others feared when we are now forced to inhabit. Is disappearance into devices inevitable? Can one exceed one's image on and fusion with the screen? Is subjective presence possible online? Being online. Non-coincidence, open inner space, sometimes called the third space, seems to me to be the issue here, as the self's minimal integrity is the boundedness that constitute a self as a self, by which Kuldry and Maeus mean the inner space of separation from what is that provides the materially grounded domain of possibility that the self has as its horizon of action and imagination. That is an open space in which any given individual experiences, reflects, and prepares to settle on her course of action. Kuldry and Maeus caution by installing automated surveillance into the space of the self. We risk losing the very thing, the open-ended space in which we continually monitor and transform ourselves over time, that constitute us as selves at all. The space of non-coincidence and empty inner space wherein one comes to form as an individual through relationships with self and others, including non-human animals and objects, is the prerequisite for forming a self-conscious relationship with devices, what Kuldry and Maias characterize as, quoting them, living with an intimate enemy. Since the device declines negotiation, this relationship requires separation for the sake of self-preservation or freedom, a political concept with its subjective substrate. As if originating in that empty inner space, the human voice, that quoting Kuldry and Maeus, unmodulated, non-predictive accounting of experience, once valued as part of social life, is excluded from big data analytics. The self splinters as it is quantified, facilitating an absorption of human life into an external totality the apparently self-sufficient world of continuous data processing. Without freedom, there can be no ethics, as quoting them, ethics must start out from an understanding of the self. While the self is social, it can also be asocial, solitary, a private self, continuous through changing circumstances, including a changing self. Subjective coherence comes from non-coincidence with the self itself, enabled by solitude privacy meditation. While all values such as privacy are socially negotiated, Goldry and Maeus allow, there is something distinctively complex about privacy and specifically the importance of privacy to autonomy, understood as that capacity to find one's own good in one's own way. Lured by technologization, many might have lost their way. Quoting them, we might acknowledge that we are most of all deeply complicit in the order of data colonialism, whether we like it or not. But any reimagining of our existing relations to data is much more than saying no, Goldry and Maeus caution, concluding, rather than silence, it is better as we stand to the side of data colonialism's road. To affirm what we know, the minimal integrity of the self that cannot simply be delegated or outsourced to automated, automatized systems that the new social order being built up through data will produce patterns of power and inequality that corrode all meaningful practices of freedom. And that these contradictions with important values can still, for now at least, be seen for what they are. This next section is um, life in prison. Lucidity and critique would appear to be humanity's last stand. It's already too late, Han tells us, quoting him. No resistance to the system can emerge in the first place, he declares, explaining that, quoting him again, under the neoliberal regime of auto-exploitation, 
people are turning their aggression against themselves. And auto-aggressivity, that means that the exploited are not inclined to revolution as much as depression. It is as if we realize, at least subliminally, that communication and control have become one without remainder. Now, everyone is, is, is his or her own panopticon on rights. We become our data, Koopman concludes. There may be no escape, but there is life in prison. This one virtual, not physical, less awful than the actual prison, of course, but confinement nonetheless. Involuntary citizenship and the techno nation state that online learning and many forms of employment require. As in actual imprisonment, actions and relationships are strictly structured now by software rather than by prison building architecture and prison guard protocols. In both actual and technological prisons, subjective presence, being there, Dasein, remains if overdetermined by software and screen. Altering our relationships with our devices may be an inefficient, uh, insufficient to challenge the techno nation state as, as Kuldry and Mayus insist. But it seems hardly irrelevant to living with an intimate enemy. It may be the only move to make. Caution is constantly required as life in prison can be toxic, dangerous physically and psychologically triggering depression and aggression, the, the latter self-directed against oneself or others, or by others against oneself. The Lewis and Guattari's assertion resonates here, quoting them, we do not lack community. On the contrary, we have too much of it. We lack creation, we lack resistance to the present. Is it in a total institution, a totalitarian technological state, what resistance is possible? Koopman poses that question this way. What is resistance in a president saturated by data? He continues, what could it even mean to be against information today? It is, he says, our functional universal. Quoting him still, to, like, to take a loud stand against data, um, the very idea, it, it's co incoherent, impossible, incredible. We live within a data episteme, and under a power of information, we are informational persons, close quote. Acknowledging that resistance can only be conducted within the operations of info power. Koopman fastens his attention on, onto info power, recommend, recommending, quoting him, a repurposing and re-leveraging information for alternative designs, noting that in their formats, which are also our formats, are already contained decisions and pathways that will entrench specific informational subjectivities for decades to come, close quote. With inner struggle, including detachment from devices, becoming subjectively present within them, we may not in every instance be reduced to information. However, channeled through information, we must be. If radios inserted the immediacy of Hitler's voice into the home's interior, Kopnik reminds, airplanes, airplanes mobilized Hitler's body into a ubiquitous visibility. A zoom seems to fabricate a fusion of the two, ubiquitous visibility and a sense of immediacy, as not only students, but colleagues and others one has never met suddenly appear on a screen inside the seclusion of one's home. What the radio and airplane accomplished jointly, Kopnik continues, was to make Hitler's political leadership seem inevitable and indisputable. Does Zoom accomplish the same? Or are, or are immediate present and real presence already illusory in an era when for many the virtual seems to supersede the material? Recalling Kopnik's account of how photography insinuated the sense of Hitler as Führer, I cannot help but hear as does Kopnik, quoting him, the uncanny echoes today between how fascism in our own image-driven times embed technological media in processes of physical and affective mobilization. 
Ah, the conclusion. As intrusions of the techno nation state inside our homes, inside ourselves, the vices materialize the most recent iteration of a trans historical trend toward technologization that was already educationally embedded in 20th century models of in-person professionalism that tended to standardize teaching, now conceived as best practices. Within this macro trend, there have been efforts at resistance and reform among the most memorable, the progressive education movement in the United States 100 years ago. Today, its remnants scattered throughout the world. The question of the human subject recurs. Anafi is clear that, quoting her, the subject is still the battlefield between threatening and threatened authority versus freedom. She recommends that, quoting her again, both left and right, if capable of it, should relaunch the normativity of politics and law against the deviations of the economy and technology. Casting economism and technologization as deviation seems hopeful indeed, as Wittgenstein's sense of foreboding seems to me more sensible, quoting him. It isn't absurd to believe that the age of science and technology is the beginning of the end for humanity, that the idea of great progress is a delusion, along with the idea that truth will be ultimately known. It is by no means obvious that this is not how things are. One can still teach and study while one waits. There remain indexical traces of the real in the techno nation state, including the presence of the human subject, even on the screen. As Anafi appreciates, quoting her, it is precisely the presence or absence of the political centrality of the subject and it's equal dignity that makes the difference. That centrality has been, is often ignored in the physical classroom. Our challenge is to make the subject central online, even if in simulated forms as traces of the real. This seems to me to be our only move to make. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to uh, invite Ying Ma to, uh, to speak. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Piner, for that illuminating critique of the techno nation state. Uh, Todd, have I done what I need to do to allow Dr. Ma to? I believe so. Okay, everyone can see Dr. Ma. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, I will share my screen. Um... So, um, So thank you very much. Um, um, and I feel very much honored to present with Dr. Pinar. And thank you, um, Dr. Spector, for chairing this session. And uh, so the, the title of my presentation is um, Returning. So I hope to start my presentation with a poem, Returning. I'm behind the screen. I look at the screen. I'm stared by the screen. I disappear into the screen. I become the screen. If only Wi-Fi were always good, Zoom, TeamViewer, Adobe Connect, YouTube, Google, I slide, type, and click to the next page, next picture, next video, next message. A virtuous society is taking shape in front of me, for me, in me, and in us for tomorrow. Vibrating sympathetically with my cell phone. Fingers swiftly dancing on the keyboard. Tell us, who was I? Who, who am I? 
where am I? Who am I becoming? Nation state techno, indispensable as limbs to the body, weaving a seamless web I have to cling to, to move here to there, to survive. Educational genomics, neural computation, AI, studiers become those that learners, innovators, exploiters. Teacher citizens, data entry clerks, revolution, depression, the historic, the techno, program with codes and colonized by data, the inner space of lives squeezing and disappearing into a universal tyranny. Hope with hopeless, escape from the inescapable. Wind blows, sun shines, bird chirps, cherry blossoms, the story tells, online, offline. Being there, I'm returning to myself. So as I ruminated on Dr. Piner's beautiful text with profound insights, I took the, this privileged opportunity to compose this uh, little poem. As Carl Lego once told us, a poem can, a poem can heal and can linger. So the title of Pinar's work, Indexical Traces of the Real, reverberates in me. What particularly intrigues me with the title is that the index seemed to sustain a less clear-cut relation to its object compared with icon or symbol. Doan observes a dialectic tension in the language of the index. The index seems to harbor a fullness, Doan said, an excessiveness of de detail that is always supplemental to meaning or intention. Yet the index asthesis implies an emptiness, a hollowness that can only be filled in the specific contingent and always mutating situations. It is this dialectic of the empty and the full that lends the index an eeriness and uncanniness. Indeed, indexical traces of will in its very nuances and indetermination remains in the presence of the human subject, even on the screen, pulling at the seamless web of the techno nation state. Globalization and technologization aggregate one another toward their common goal of hegemony and standardization. In contrary to a cosmopolitan education, which subjective structuration informed by and addressed to the historical moment with which subjectivity occurs and takes social form, technologized education monitors supervises, and even with devices under our skin, colonizing and erasing the inner sacred space of each particular human being. The educational system today often desires more advanced technology to fix the immediate issues. However, it neglects the fundamental questions as Pinar and Grant press us to think. What is technology? And what does it do to us? So Dr. Pina asked about what roles do teacher citizens play in this datafication of social life? So as, my teach, as a teacher myself and a mother of two young children, I often ask myself the same question when I give online classes to teacher candidates in my, in my Vancouver home to uh, the university students in China. And when my sons took online piano or Chinese language courses during the pandemic, provided by a VIP kit, a listed online teaching company. Besides the efforts of calculating the time zone difference, they seem to be a fuzzy free and borderless learning opportunities. But however, as a teacher, I often experience a lack, a significant lack in the learnification of education. I could feel my awkwardness when I, when I talk to the screen very enthusiastically and um, passionately, but only like find the, like my students stop video where they mute themselves. I can only look at and frown at and smile at the camera, which is like a little black hole 
at the interface, sucking in the sparks of passions and wonders. And sometimes the Zoom lagged or got stuck or frozen, as if the present was frozen into the screen. As a mother, I'm worried as well. I'm worried about besides the convenient learning opportunities, what is highlighted and neglected in the commercialized teaching models in the convenient learning procedures. I wonder when teaching is filtered by the online tools, propelled by the preset learning goals, oriented around markets and revenues, what then will remain? Is there a possibility to escape the inescapable? Being online, as Dr. Piner said, as an existential subjective basin seemed to be a difficult but necessary task. Being resist presentism, which precipitates stripping away the past and fading the future. Being requires reactivating the past in relation to one, one another, attending to our situatedness. So despite of um, Sisyphus condemned efforts to keep pushing the big rock up and up again in the mountain, he was considered the happiest person in Camus' eyes. Sisyphus was creating meanings in the meaningless world with endurance and courageously, courageously overcoming existential difficulties of being a human. During the pandemic, people gather in Zooms to teach, to chat and connect, is there then possible for us to transform the Zoom into the suburb of Florence in 14th century? To generate the meaning structured by subjectivity threaded with historicity and ethics, however determined by software and screen? Are we struggling to push the rock up and up again? As Pina proposes, non-coincidence with inner struggles is the key, indeed, Cosmopolitan education sometimes necessitates discomfort, unsettlement, and friction. I hope to claim the sovereignty of my inner space with a difficult separation of the given. I'm searching for the indexical traces of the real in the presence of the human subject while living with intimate enemy, without delusion or fantasy, but wide awakeness and human dignity. So finally, I wonder, I wonder about what are the sources for the non-coincidence and hope to create a civic square and a room of my own as a teacher. I imagine sources for non-coincidence might be alternative languages, discourses beyond the modernity's emphasis on efficiency and bureaucracy. We have to have genuine conversations as human beings. Listen to the voices of others with more attention, recollect a piece of memory, respond to an unruly child, even take a slow walk in the neighborhood, or just touch the rough barks of the tree. To have the poetic encounters with now, the now is a juxtaposed moment among the past, the present, and the future with oneself and others and the world, online, offline. So life bears renewed possibilities and it becomes a palimpsest, quoting Pinar, a manuscript that original traces remain, yet leave room for new later writings. I almost imagine with modesty though, the indexical traces flicker and twinkle with the lights of humanity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ma, for that very powerful response to Dr. Pinar's work. And the uh, opening in particular really struck me with the irony of returning. I wasn't sure if we were going back in time, but we were talking about the return of the keys. So thank you for that. We have um, about 15 minutes for a discussion that could start with some uh, questions and uh, perhaps because I can't see everyone, Todd, should we use the chat bar for questions? The chat has actually been disabled, yeah. but if folks would like to submit questions to the Q&A function, they're more than welcome to do so. Okay, great. So that might be the best 
way to uh, tackle questions for our panelists through the Q&A. I'd like to add, Hannah, yeah. um, the powerful, uh, powerful poem that you offered Dr. Ying Ma was um, very touching. And uh, it's hard to come away from your presentation with Dr. Piners without um, thinking of the emotion, uh, what has been expressed over this last year with regards to schools being opened and closed and how in some ironic paradoxical ways, the ability to do what we are doing right now kind of saved some of the schools. It saved some of higher education maybe, maybe temporarily, but uh, at the same time, we're also uh, reduced to trying to reconcile simultaneity as Dr. Morris mentioned, we're always in the past and the present and the future at the same time and wondering how in the human condition do we survive that uh, always already here. All right, there is a, a question from Marla Morris or a, a comment here that I can bring up. It says, AI is the most dangerous, scary thing today. The film Ex Machina is about this. Can you comment on the problem of AI and how it could make us extinct? Well, um, as you know, um, uh, several celebrities, among them Elon Musk, um, have expressed their uh, deep concern about AI. Um, in, um, in, a, in a new, uh, in Tony Ord's new book, um, uh, in which he chronicles the, uh, the challenges facing humanity, uh, over nuclear war, over climate change, over economic inequality and the political instability that follows, he names AI as the, as the major challenge. And he cites the surveys of AI researchers who um, 10% uh, of whom uh, predict by 2025, uh, AI will become, uh, exceed the capacity of human cognition. And uh, over 80% think by uh, 2035 um, that AI will exceed. So it's, uh, um, it, it, um, um, it, uh, it threatens to, uh, um, uh, to overrule. Uh, uh, the, the modalities of our own reasoning um, uh, that can't be um, uh, represented in an algorithmic way. That is judgment that is informed by feeling, uh, by apprehension of, uh, uh, of what's non-quantifiable, uh, uh, and by, uh, by memories that, that can't be encoded um, uh, in software. So um, yes, Marla, um, and thanks for the reference to the to the movie. Um, again, there's nothing uh, to be done. Uh, it's going um, it's going forward, unabated. Although, did you see the news item uh, last week? The European Union uh, drafted uh, an outline for regulation of AI within the member states. It's not approved yet. It's an outline, but you you might want to check it out. That at least the European Union is taking seriously some of these uh, expressed concerns uh, about the dangers of AI and, uh, and that it should be subject uh, to human regulation. I'll just um, add to how 2000 from Space Odyssey 2001 takes over, yeah. right? And yes. says, yes. no, this, this mission is too important for you humans. We have to continue on. Uh, that's right. Um, we have uh, several other questions here. Um, uh, Laura Richardson says she enjoyed both presentations. Dr. Pinar, sh uh, she is if she is interpreting your presentation correctly, 
that there are only negatives to the techno nation state or are there benefits to the untapped human potential that AI may unearth? Um, well, in a, in a, um, in a section uh, of the uh, paper I, I didn't read um, for reasons of time, I, uh, I discussed um, an experience I had in the fall teaching online. And um, in that course, if I can uh, uh, state it very briefly, I asked each student to, in 100 words, to choose a passage from their reading and then comment on it and maybe raise a question. Um, and they occupied the screen as, uh, as we are now. It became a kind of encounter between the student and me. Uh, it's, the risk was, of course, it made us exhibitionists and everyone else voyeurs. But what it did is enable a kind of um, a directness of, of response that I think being in a physical classroom with the, 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 the physical presence of another person next to you and that sense of a kind of group mind, however unarticulated it might be, uh, suppresses. Uh, so on that, uh, in that Zoom encounter, I thought there was a, uh, a subtlety uh, and intricacy uh, of the exchange that um, is rarely possible, even in a, in a small size seminar. So I do think that there are affordances um, that, um, that online technologies offer us. But again, I, I, I think given um, the overall um, tendency of it, that the metaphor of the prison is helpful, that, that we try to make a life within the prison in which we've been uh, uh, incarcerated. But there is life in prison. And now the point, rather than continually wailing over our fate or, um, or unless we can regulate it as the EU thinks it can, I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, I think profit is uh, such a god that, it, that, um, that the AI will, be, will find a way around regulation. But in any case, there, there is life in prison and we can still become present to each other. Well, there's even love in prison. It's, uh, it, it's obviously sometimes um, often forced and certainly structured by protocols and, and, um, and, and, uh, uh, and software. But, um, but for me, that's the, the, the challenge uh, in the short term, at least, is to try to find a way to become present and to study and to teach uh, on the screen, in the screen, embedded in the screen with the screen embedded in us. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Bruce from UBC. He said he asks, "Can I ask about how technology helps government of self and other in a way that nation state recedes to the background and cybernetics automates education, but also government, public and private partnership is already in place for that." In his view, any comments? Uh, hi, Bruce. Um, well, um, public partner, uh, public private partnerships. Mm. Yeah, we'll, we'll see who the, the dominant partner is in that. Uh, in terms of the governance of the self, I mean, certainly the way the Foucault discusses that tradition, and particularly its archaic, uh, ancient Greek and, and Roman forms. It, it lacks the, in, in, in the data analytics uh, reiteration of it, it, it lacks uh, the internally um, ever shifting um, sense of, uh, of, of what the situation calls for, of, of where you are in your life, what, you, what you're obligated to do with those you love and and, and have obligations too, even when you maybe don't love them, but you nonetheless have obligations. All of that is not a quantifiable because it's an ever shifting, elusive, uh, ever subtle, embodied temporal uh, matter. Um, so I think that uh, it's at odds with any governance of self that, that Foucault hoped might be um, re reactivated from, from the past. Um, but you know I thought that, Bruce. <laughs> okay, another question is from Nathan Hensley. 
Can you further comment on yes, the Nathan. Can you further comment on the mechanical language of seeing the brain as quote mental software end quote that requires updating all of the time? What opportunity is there for curriculum scholars to address this mechanistic worldview? Mm. Well, I, th there are endless opportunities as long as uh, as long as we're not silenced. Uh, um, but it, but um, free speech is worthless, isn't it? It's not um, compensated. Um, um, there, there are many people contesting it, uh, including the people in, in this room. Um, so, um, you know, no, there are many opportunities to, to contest it, uh, and contest it we must. Um, as far as a further elaboration of this kind of metaphor, I mean, I, I recommend the Williamson book. There, there, there are two of them, actually, but the 2017 one is the one I, I quoted uh, today. Um, ben Williamson teaches in um, in Scotland, but it it'll give you, I think, a um, a strong sense of, uh, of of the kind of language that's uh, that's being um, enforced here. Thank you. We have a few more minutes, so if there are any other comments or questions for Dr. Pinar or Dr. Ma, uh, I'll offer from. Uh, Walter Gerstown, he's talking about the underlife in institutions that has been taken up over the years to speak of classroom interactions. Is it possible that the underlife is possibly part of these movements within the episteme? Did the best I could, Walter. Yeah, I, I don't understand what that means. Maybe Walter could add a few amplify that or I asked him I asked him to amplify I asked him to amplify the underlife part and we also have from Ziki Arcel how does technology affect learning outcomes related to affective domain well it colonizes them it colonizes them I mean the, the scheme here is with, especially with the uh, with IBM's Watson in a partnership with um, with Pearson is to install sensors under every child's skin and provide real-time data uh, of moods, uh, struggles, frustrations, uh, even uh, cognitive um, uh, maneuvers to uh, whenever a child is a, a, a grappling with whatever these corporate employees have produced as uh, what they must learn. And uh, the, I, I, it's not quite clear to me how Watson then is going to um, uh, um, funnel back uh, th this data in some kind of um, form that enables a, a person or the teacher bot to intervene in the, the student's behavior. But certainly that's the aspiration. So with only a momentary lag, the information will go from under the skin of the child to, to Watson and back again to whatever is in charge, mechanical or, or human, and then intervention will be made that presumably optimizes the affective as well as cognitive outcome of that particular learning uh, episode. Do we have time for one more question, Todd? There's one from Doug Van Dyke. Yep, I'm trying to read from one of my students here. Can you read it, Hannah? Sure, the one from Doug? Yeah. Okay, so thank you both for your wonderful presentations. To this optimist, I take the themes of both presentations, yet more fervent calls for significant digital literacy education not only literacies about how to navigate hardware, software, and networks, but literacies that delve into the power of algorithms and the human biases that are encoded in them. The distinctions between privacy and identity, making visible the invisibilities of ICT to empower people within the digital space, to barely scratch the surface of, of such understandings needs. Any comments on that? Yeah, great. Um, every prisoner 
uh, upon incarceration should receive a how to survive in prison handbook. Right. Yeah. And um, and digital literacy could be incredibly helpful. I, I'm all for it. Go for it. But don't forget, you're still you're still incarcerated. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, um, it is now three o'clock, and we want to thank you very much, Dr. Pinar and Dr. Ma, for your illuminating presentations. Yeah and for everyone uh, to be here and to participate together. This has been recorded and I believe Dr. Ma is going to be uploading it to YouTube sometime even today. So if you want to review any of it again, you will be able to. Um, and we wanna thank you and we hope to see you at future sessions coming up shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank so you everyone. Much, Todd, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.